if you pay attention this morning, take notes, you're going to find this to be a really valuable equipping time. And the first section of our time together is going to be devoted to the arguments for God's existence and the critique of the new atheism. Now let me ask, how many people were at the talk last night at UC Davis? Okay, a good number, that's good because then I won't need to review these arguments as much and can save some time by looking more at the criticisms and just briefly summarizing the arguments. A year or so ago, I published a cover story in Christianity Today called God is Not Dead Yet, and I described the revival among current philosophers of arguments for the existence of God. And it was interesting to read the reactions to this article in the blogosphere. Along with the expressions of appreciation, there were also comments like the following. Dawkins' The God Delusion soundly deals with these arguments. Did you even do any research? Or this one. Have you even read Dawkins' misspelled book? <laughs> he answers every one of those arguments quite well. Or this one, I was dismayed that someone as well known as Dr. Craig has used these arguments to defend the existence of God. As someone mentioned before, has he even read Dawkins' book? Well now, on one hand, it's not surprising that uh, people would turn to Richard Dawkins for refutation of the arguments for God's existence because when you read the books of the new atheists, like Christopher Hitchens and Sam Harris, they have almost nothing to say in response to the arguments for God's existence. And Dawkins is one of the few of the new atheists who actually does address these arguments. Nonetheless, what's remarkable about these co comments is the degree of confidence that is reposed in Dawkins' refutations. Are they right? Has Richard Dawkins really dealt the death blow to these arguments for God's existence? Well, what I want to do this morning is to look at each of these arguments and see what Dawkins has to say in response to each one. Now, before we look at any specific argument, however, I want to be clear about what makes for a good argument, because sometimes this is a source of confusion. An argument doesn't need to prove its conclusion with 100% certainty in order to be a good argument. Rather, a good argument must meet three conditions. Number one, it obeys the rules of logic. It obeys the rules of logic. That is to say, the conclusion follows logically from the premises. Two, its premises are true. It must not only be logically valid, but the premises of the argument must be true. And thirdly, the premises are more plausible than their opposites. The premises are more plausible than their negations or their contradictories. So the premises don't need to be certainly true. They simply need to be more plausibly true than their negations. Now, so defined, are there good arguments for God's existence? Well, in my article in Christianity Today, the first argument I discussed was a form of the cosmological argument um, known as uh, the Kalam cosmological argument. Now, what does Dawkins have to say about this? Well, first let me formulate the argument for you, and let's put that on the screen. Number one, everything that begins to exist has a cause. Two, the universe began to exist. Three, therefore the universe has a cause. And once we reach the conclusion that the universe has a cause, then we can analyze what properties a cause of the universe would have to have. Now premise one, I think, seems obviously true. It, it, it's at least more plausibly true than its negation. First and foremost, the premise is rooted in the metaphysical intuition that something cannot come into being out of nothing. Uh, to suggest that things could just pop into being uncaused out of nothing is literally worse than magic. Uh, it's to quit doing serious philosophy and appeal to magic. Secondly, if things could come into being uncaused from nothing, then it becomes inexplicable why just anything and everything doesn't cause, come into being uncaused from nothing. Why doesn't root beer and Beethoven and bicycles just pop into being uncaused out of nothing? 
And finally, thirdly, the first premise is constantly confirmed in our experience. Uh, we have the strongest of motivations, I think, therefore, to accept the first premise. What about premise two? Well, this can be supported by both philosophical arguments and scientific evidence. The philosophical arguments aim to show that the idea of an infinite regress of events in time is impossible, or in other words, the number of past events must be finite, and therefore the universe had a beginning. Now the philosophical arguments for the finna due to the past are fascinating and mind-expanding, but we don't need to go into them here this morning because Dawkins doesn't dispute any of these arguments. He doesn't uh, refer to them at all. The scientific evidence for the beginning of the universe is based on the expansion of the universe. According to the Big Bang model, uh, physical space and time, as well as all matter and energy in the universe, came into being about 13.7 billion years ago in a cataclysmic event known as the Big Bang. And if we could have a slide of that, this will illustrate uh, uh, geometrically uh, how space-time had a beginning. Now what makes the Big Bang so remarkable, so stunning, is that it represents the origin of the universe from literally nothing. As the physicist PCW Davies explains, the coming into being of the universe as discussed in modern science is not just a matter of imposing some sort of organization upon a previous incoherent state, but literally the coming into being of all physical things from nothing. Now of course alternative theories have been crafted over the years to try to avoid the absolute beginning predicted by the Big Bang model. But none of these alternatives has commended itself to the scientific community as more plausible than the Big Bang Theory. In fact, in 2003, Arvind Bord, Alan Guth, and Alexander Vilenkin were able to demonstrate that any universe, any universe, which is on average in a state of cosmic expansion over its history, cannot be eternal in the past but had to have an absolute beginning. Vilenkin pulls no punches. This is what he says. It is said that an argument is what convinces reasonable men, and a proof is what it takes to convince even an unreasonable man. With the proof now in place, and by that he means the bord guth vilenkin theorem, cosmologists can no longer hide behind the possibility of a past eternal universe. There is no escape. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. Now it follows from the two premises of the cosmological argument that therefore the universe has a cause. Now what properties must such a cause of the universe possess? Well, by the very nature of the case, as the cause of space and time, this entity must transcend space and time and therefore must exist timelessly and non-spatially, at least without the universe. This transcendent cause must therefore also be immaterial and changeless, since anything that is timeless has to be changeless, and anything that is changeless has to be immaterial, since material things are constantly changing, at least on the molecular and atomic level. Such a cause must be beginningless, and uncaused since there cannot be an infinite regress of causes. Um, this entity must be unimaginably powerful since it created the universe without any material cause. It created the matter and energy itself. Finally, and most remarkably, such a transcendent first cause is plausibly personal. Let me give two reasons why I think this is a personal creator. First, the personhood of the first cause is implied by its timelessness and immateriality. You see, the only entities that we know of that can possess those properties are either abstract objects, like numbers, or else an unembodied mind or consciousness. But abstract objects don't stand in causal relations. The number seven, for example, doesn't have any effects on anything. 
and therefore it follows that the transcendent cause of the universe must be an unembodied mind or consciousness. Secondly, this same conclusion is implied by the origin of an effect with a beginning from a timeless cause. We've concluded that the beginning of the universe must be the effect of a first cause. Now, by the very nature of the case, that cause cannot have any further cause because there cannot be an infinite regress of causes. It is simply a beginningless, uh, timeless, changeless, first, uncaused cause. Now, when you think about it, that's extremely odd. If 